All right, next up we have Senate File 11, also being presented by Senator Abler today on Senator Housley's behalf. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to move Senate File 11, and I uh, will discuss the dis disposition uh, later. But um, this bill is, as compared to the one we just did, is decidedly controversial, and it uh, touches many, many lives. The question of electronic monitoring in uh, in uh, assisted livings and nursing homes uh, has been one that's been extremely controversial, and this committee is no stranger to the uh, the challenges of individuals and all the findings of maltreatment and, and, and all of that. And so there's been a great deal of work done in the interim, Mr. Chair and members, uh, to try to resolve some of the elements of this. This is a really big part of, the, of uh, working through some of that, allowing the question of shall we allow electronic monitoring or not and how shall we do it. There's a number of witnesses who would like to come and testify about this. And so, but I think first if we get the uh, maybe we can get the bill in shape and then I'll offer some comments and then we'll take testimony and after that I think we can stand for questions. I think that would be efficient. Sounds good. So you do have an amendment, Senator Abler? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A5 amendment. Senator Abler moves the A5 amendment. And uh, if I could just get the, the amendment in order, there's a technical amendment, the A6, and if I could move the A6 to the A5, then um, that would be... I think the cleanest way, Mr. Chair. Okay, Senator Abler moves the A5 amendment. All in favor say aye. Oh. Oh, Mr. Chair, uh, no, with the A6 is to the A5. So if oh, I'm just, sorry, the A6 just, amendment. We can just hold on that vote for a minute. Okay. So eventually we'd like to vote on the A6 first and then to the A5. And um, I believe it's uh, mostly technical, and Mr. Monahan could comment if you uh, want any more detail about that. It's technical. All right, now that we all have the A6 amendment in front of us, um, Senator Abler moves the A6 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion does prevail. And Mr. Chair, would you like me to describe the A5 the A amendment as amended? For I think I will do that. And then just, yes, please. It's just in respect for the system, and I've got a, a few comments. And then I think we could um, put the bill in order and then take testimony. So. Um, Anyway, so I'm, I've got a few comments just to, to read from uh, actually Senator uh, Housley. Uh, this bill is a collaboration of many stakeholder meetings el hosted by Minnesota Elder Justice Center. I'd like to thank Amanda Vickstrom and Sean Burke for holding the meetings. Uh, this bill establishes the conditions where electronic monitoring is a protected right of residences of a nursing facility, a boarding care home, or certain housing with services establishments, including assisted living settings, which has been the whole subject of the discussion in particular. The bill provides definitions of electronic monitoring, uh, meaning a camera or other device that captures, records, or broadcasts audio, video, or both, that is placed in a resident's room or private living unit and is used to monitor the resident or activities in the room. It also defines resident representative and the priority order listed. Uh, first, it's a court-appointed gu guardian, a healthcare agent, or a person who is not an agent of a facility or of a home care provider designate, designate uh, in writing by the resident and maintain in the resident's records on file with the facility. And Mr. Chair, I'll just comment. Every word of this amendment has been hard negotiated and <laughs> so it sounds like it's so straightforward, but it's not at all. Uh, the bill allows a resident or resident representative to conduct electronic monitoring of the resident's room or private living space and clarifies that electronic, moni electronic monitoring in this section is not a covered service under medical assistance, uh, home and community-based waiver plans. The bill specifies the requirements for the notification and consent form. The form must include how and where consent was obtained, the type of device, and a how and when the recording can be disseminating. disseminated. A copy of the completed form must be placed in the residence and any roommate's clinical record. On January, 20, uh, January 1st, 2020, facilities must make the form available and inform residents of their option to conduct electronic monitoring. This bill requires the resident to consent in writing to electronic monitoring. If the resident has not objected and the resident's medical professional determines the resident lacks the ability to understand uh, the consequences of electronic monitoring, the resident representative may consent on the resident's behalf. It also allows residents to place conditions on the monitoring. 
If the resident has a roommate, the roommate must provide consent before installing electronic monitoring. If the roommate refuses to consent, the facility must make reasonable accommodations. Additionally, both the resident and the roommate can withdraw consent at any time. Uh, and this is in uh, quite a bit of contrast to the current law, which is anybody can do anything, anytime, and not tell anybody. So this is a, a, big, a big move uh, on both sides, frankly. The bill requires the facility to be notified before the electronic monitoring is conducted. There is an exception. Uh, that's provided for the resident or resident representative who fears retaliation by the facility for placing a camera if the resident meets the listed qualifications notifies the office of the ombudsman for long-term care prior to conducting electronic monitoring, and they have 14 days of this period. The, the bill also specifies the residents responsible for the cost of installation and the monitoring. Also, the facility must post signs that, that electronic monitoring may be occurring at their facility. The bill provides, prohibits anyone from knowingly and without permission interfering with the device unless the facility does so because a resident or roommate withdraws consent. It also prohibits anyone from accessing any recordings without permission and prohibits dissemination of recordings except to address the welfare of a resident. It provides for the admissibility of recording as evidence in legal proceedings and gives the facility immunity from civil or criminal liability arising from a resident or resident representative disseminating a recording. And you know this uh, bill has a little ways to go through other committees to handle some of those topics. It also prohibits the facility from refusing to admit or removing a resident or retaliating or discriminating against a resident from the resident's choice to install electronic monitoring. I'm really sorry we have to even address that topic, but it has happened. Additionally, the facility may not prevent the installation or use of electronic monitoring provided the resident has provided written consent and notice to the facility or the ombudsman of long-term care. The bill does not require anyone conducting electronic monitoring to comply with the requirements of the bill. Oh, it does require that, uh, that this has to be complied with by January 1st, 2020. And finally, the bill requires the Commissioner of Health to develop and make available the notification and consent form for monitoring by January 1st. Um, and so that's a lot to say, um, but I really just want to personally comment that I want to commend all the players, and you're going to hear from a bunch of them today, for engaging in sincere, earnest, hard negotiations on the part of the, the clients and the facilities and the workers. And um, it's just part of the challenges we face in this uh, work environment that such a, such a bill is even necessary. But I'm really happy that it's come this far. And uh, Senator Housley is uh, rejoicing in the fact that we have a hearing today on a, on a product that's moving forward. And so, um, and so maybe, Mr. Chair, we could adopt the amendment now and then stand for, uh, stand for the, the testimony. Sounds great. Senator Abler moves the A5 delete everything amendment. All those uh, in favor? As, a, as amended. As amended, excuse me. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now that we're in order, um, any other discussion or are you ready for testifiers, uh, I think Senator testimony Abler? is appropriate and then Perfect. questions will be very much in order. All right, so we will start calling up the testifiers. I think we'll have everybody come through and testify, and then we'll yes. move to questions after that. So if anybody who testifies would please stick around uh, just in case there are questions for you. We'll bring up Chris Sundberg and Richard Brightman, and then after that, if uh, Patty Sagert and Kay Bromelkamp would be ready to come on up after they finished, uh, that would be perfect. When you get up here, please sign in and state your name for the record and go ahead and get started right away. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much uh, for hearing our testimony today. I'm Chris Sundberg, and I'm president of Elder Voice Family Advocates. We are family members, caregivers, elder abuse professionals, and others who are committed to assuring that all who live in senior living settings get quality care and are treated with respect in a caring environment. Uh, we have several members here, Richard, Kay Bromelkamp, and uh, Patty Sagert, who will also be talking about the value of having cameras in the rooms of their, their loved ones. Uh, we have seen personally how many 
uh, times having a camera can improve the care uh, and give peace of mind and sometimes it can literally save a life. We will be advocating for clarifying the use of electronic monitoring and we support much of what's in this bill but not everything. What we strongly believe is that safety, it should be the priority. Safety overshadows privacy issues in cases where there's concern that abuse, neglect, or exploitation is occurring, or when the care needs are extensive and the family wants to supplement uh, the monitoring and care that staff may not be able to provide. Additionally, we believe that there should be no mandated uh, notification to the facility or care provider, and certainly not 14 days. We have seen too many times that problems get much worse with abuse of staff who intimidate or scare residents to manipulate them into agreeing to whatever they want. Retaliation is often the outcome when uncooperative care facilities or caregivers fear what the camera is going to show. Instead, there should be a shared goal of ensuring safe, quality care is given to everybody. Many states are far ahead of Minnesota in allowing electronic monitoring. Texas passed its electronic monitoring bill in 2001. Oklahoma unanimously passed their Protect Our Loved Ones Act in 2013. New Mexico, Washington, Utah, Illinois, Florida, and then last year, Louisiana have also passed their electronic monitoring bills. The New Jersey and Wisconsin attorney generals actually lend residents cameras to assure safe care in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And the Ohio Attorney General will actually place a camera themselves into the rooms in certain conditions. We ask ourselves daily how many of the deaths and maltreatment incidents could have been avoided if a camera had been in use, enabling early detection of a change in health condition, abuse, or poor care being given. Would the 58-year-old man be alive today instead of being beaten to death at Chappie's Golden Shores in Hill City, as the Star Tribune reported a week or so ago. To get a better understanding of the neglect, abuse, and retaliation issues, Elder Voice is going through the OHFC investigation data for the past seven years. A report of our findings uh, will come out uh, in March. However, we are already seeing how valuable ca cameras have been in learning of and stopping this maltreatment. Just a few examples of substantiated investigations where a, a camera verified the abuse include sexual assault, residents being repeatedly hit, slapped, and roughly pushed and shoved, causing serious injury and bruises and, and many others being humiliated by being yelled at, uh, being improperly trance, or being moved naked through the resident hallways and other such examples. Video evidence in a hibbing facility records that a resident was improperly transferred to a wheelchair. He fell and was left on the floor for over four hours. A Columbia Heights facility did not respond to a man with a history of hernia problems, and he was screaming, help me, help me, because the stomach pain was so severe. He was left in excruciating pain until the next day when they finally took him to the ER. He died that night. And the physician stated that had the patient been brought earlier, the outcome could have been better. A camera alerting the family might have saved this man from a very painful death. 
Additionally, our review of over 100 substantiated uh, financial exploitation case, uh, cases in housing with services and assisted living facilities showed that over $1,000 was being stole per resident. Cameras in their rooms often verified these cases, and in many other cases, it was video footage from a bank or other retail establishment that proved the, th the theft. In conclusion, we support stronging a strong uh, electronic monitoring law that puts safety of the resident as the highest priority and doesn't require notification to the facility out of fear of retaliation. This having cameras is already a right uh, in Minnesota since we are a one party consent state. Please don't restrict our right to know what is happening to our loved ones and make sure they are safe and well cared for. Thank you for listening to our concerns. Thank you, Richard. Go ahead and start when you're ready to state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Richard Brightman. Honor thy mother and thy father. A picture is worth a thousand words. These are two key concepts for you to consider in guaranteeing my right to protect my mother through the monitoring that the video provides. I have done this for two and a half years. I was introduced to it by people who are now leaders in Elder Voice, but who at the time had their own concerns and their own needs. And I learned an enormous amount about the value. As I sit here today, I can see my mother safely in her room at an assisted living facility. Four of us are watching, my wife, my sister in Los Angeles, and a temporary or a part-time aide who comes in as needed, the need sometimes arising from what is seen on the cameras. It's 24-7 protection. It's notifications that alert you to movement in the room, and you can also have notifications of sound. As Chris mentioned, somebody yelling, help me, help me, more often than not, goes unattended. If you're listening to your mother yell, help me, help me, through the camera, as I have, you call the nursing home or the assisted living facility. Someone gets to her in a short time. And maybe a worse event, as has been described here, is avoided. The value of this is unbelievable. The efforts to somehow control or limit it astound me. I quote the senator who this morning said, under the current law, anybody can do anything anytime and not tell anyone. In the privacy of a room that you are renting for a premium of $2,500 in order to have aides or nurses in the assisted living facility available to come to help your mother. You are paying for the privacy of that room, and in that room you have the right to do whatever you want within the bounds of the law. And the law currently says, I can protect my mother. She has fallen three times, and I have observed that and called for help. Fortunately, there was no serious injury. On September 1st, unfortunately, when no one was monitoring, because obviously we can't 24-7, it's available to us, she fell and fractured her hip. She lay on the floor for an hour. The door to the room to the hallway is always open. She was yelling, help, help, for an hour at an assisted living facility that purports to provide aides who are there, who are monitoring and aware. 
They were blind, deaf, and dumb that day. And had I, as I had on three prior occasions, monitored and seen that she had fallen, perhaps she could have gotten some help a little sooner. But her anxiety level right now in moving from her lift chair to a walker or a walker to a wheelchair is enormous. It's a consequence of that event. And people are suffering that kind of emotional trauma frequently when they go unaided by the people who are supposed to be there helping them. I, I came here to talk about three things. That was my introduction. I'm sorry it was a little bit long. By the way, I just a little background. I've been a television producer and director for 10 years. I went to law school. I clerked for Rosalie Wall as a clerk on the, uni, uh, on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I worked at the Maslin Law Firm for a short time before I began working as a private immigration lawyer. I work very hard to protect our borders, particularly the one we have with Iowa. <laughs> as I've said, the, the cameras, you cannot, I, I'm absolutely astounded to think what is the nursing home or the assisted living facility's objections to the cameras? I, as a lawyer, am subject to critique by my clients or other people, judges and others, and I can face consequences for screwing up. What is wrong with a nursing home or assisted living facility learning as I have educated them about the incapacity and lack of training that goes on? I have videos, hundreds of hours of videos, and many of them show incompetence. And as a result, there are people who used to work there that don't work there anymore. And nobody would know about this except for a person providing black and white, or in my case, color, video about what is going on or not going on. So, and there is a very, there, it's an amazing thing. I'm not much into uh, Facebook or any of the social media stuff. I don't do any of that, really. But this camera situation has a subjective and very valuable quality. My sister is in Los Angeles. Lori has been there for many years. She's monitoring my mother. Sometimes I'll get a call and I'll, she'll say, hey, did you see that? Maybe there was something that needed helping. I would call and get some help. But it has attached my sister to my mother in a way that she would never experience in her quarterly visits for long weekends. I mean, when you see your mother and you can protect her, you're doing something extraordinarily valuable and that what, and you're doing something that no nursing home or assisted living facility can provide at the present time. So I consider myself to be a junkie to the camera because when it's gone out, and when I've lost the ability to know my mother is safe and secure, I'm very concerned. A second topic is this topic of consent. I find it extraordinarily interesting to say under the current law, anybody can do anything and not tell anybody. Well, do you know something? The nursing homes, the assisted living, the mem memory care units, they can do anything they want and they don't have to tell anybody. Because right now and for years in the past, they have been recording by video your very movements throughout the fac uh, facilities. So that's something that you may not have been aware of, but it's something that they do, and they do unrestrained, unregulated. I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I think I got that phrase right. Um, to have my mother, my mother's 97 years old, bless her, and um, to ask her to consent in any fashion to this is patently absurd. Um, I have a power of attorney. I manage her health, her welfare, her finances, everything about it, and I give her the buck to go play bingo. But to say that she should in any way affect the ability of me to protect her because she doesn't offer a consent of any fashion 
is ridiculous. I don't know what harm there is by my seeing how my mother is cared for. I don't know what is being hidden except for the incidents that have been testified to just prior to me. And those kinds of things you should be very concerned about. We all should, because we're all going to get there someday. And we're going to all want to have the best protection and care and concern that's available to us, or that can be available, particularly through the cameras. Uh, in addition to cameras and consent, the third thing I wanted to talk about is retaliation. Uh, we've experienced it. In October of 2016, my mother had an event that took her to the hospital. Coming back, she was debilitated, weaker. Uh, she needed more care, more observation. And I was beside myself wondering, how am I going to accomplish that? Because 24-7 care costs you 300 bucks a day. And quite honestly, the immigration law practice is good, but it ain't that good. So I put out a, thing, a notice on Nextdoor, a wonderful way to communicate with your neighbors. And there are 22,000 in the neighborhood. And someone came back to me who was in this group, and at the time, not at the time the group had not formed, and said, Nest cameras. And I learned an enormous amount about that. And we put them in. We put them there, we didn't hide them, we didn't conceal them, because we weren't worried about thievery or anything else. I just wanted to watch my mother. I wanted to make sure she was okay. Well, they didn't like that at the nursing home. We received a number of, it, it, it happened in many ways. Refusals to serve, refusal to provide services for which you're paying 2,500 buck premium to have access to aides and to nurses. And they said to me, a month after we put the cameras in, mom had another event, took her to the ER at Abbott, a wonderful hospital. And the driver thought maybe she could have a broken wrist. Turned out she didn't. So when we spent eight hours at the ER, we were going home. Metro Mobility, another fine service in the community, which I so strongly support, took mom home, and I was driving to her assisted living place when I got a call from the senior nurse and a senior manager. They said to me that they would not be able to provide the aids or nurse uh, services that we were paying a lot of money for because mother had a splint on her wrist and a sling on her arm, and their people were not trained to care for that. So they said, if your mother needs help, and as in the past, she would push the pendant if she remembered. I won't be too much longer. <laughs> she would push the pendant or somehow someone would get into her and they would help her. They said to me, ain't going to happen. If your mom pushes the pendant, we're going to call 911 and we're going to get them out here to care for your mom. Ridiculous, of course. But uh, this retaliation against us was very serious. It cost us a lot of money to put in place some particular people to care for her. And other aspects of the retaliation became slanderous comments and statements and uh, other, troublesome, other troublesome things. So I just want to conclude and say that consent is not needed. I, as an adult with the power of attorney, can make wise decisions. You better trust the kids who care for their folks. Cameras are, essent are an essential and valuable commodity in this process of caring for your mom. And frankly, I think that retaliation should be a criminal offense. It's a very serious and life-threatening type of behavior that our society should not tolerate at all. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Next up, we have Patty Sagert and Kay Bromelkamp. And after that, uh, Michelle Wood and Toby Peterson or Pearson. Uh, Mr. Chair. And, and while they're coming, if I could just offer some uh, help along the way here. I, I think that the two witnesses who just have come have really queued up some of the, the topics that really have been, I think they summarized very well 
what's had hours and hours of discussion. And so um, if, if the next testifier is coming forward, could if as a we're actually working on a specific bill with recommendations, and so they can offer their own personal comments, but if they could also focus on the bill that's in front of us about what specifics that they think are deficient or meritorious. That would help us. We have 45 minutes, and we'd like to have a discussion as well. So thank Great you. Great idea. Thank you, Senator Abler. Go ahead and state your name for the record, and go ahead as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, for hearing my testimony today. My name is Patty Sagert. I'm the daughter of Dennis and Janet. Both of my parents are struggling with their health at this time. My mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer over two and a half years ago. At this point, it is incurable but treatable. My mom lives independently in a senior apartment in Blaine. My dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's over 10 years ago. In November 2017, he suffered a debilitating stroke that affected his right side and his speech. He has lived in a memory care assisted living facility since August 19th of 2015. Unfortunately, along this journey, we've had to move him three times due to neglect. He currently lives in Vadnais Heights. We have continued to see my dad deteriorate and struggle with his, his health due to the Alzheimer's and stroke. My mom is unable to spend as much time with him due to her battle with cancer. I adhere to Ronald Reagan's mantra, trust but verify. I firmly believe that cameras should be allowed in care facilities without having to gain consent from the facility. Families should have the choice and right to install cameras in their loved one's private apartments. They should not fear eviction or retaliation should they install cameras for the safety and monitoring of their loved ones. Today, we should assume that in most settings we're on being monitored, we're being videotaped, whether we're pumping gas, driving down the freeway, in the most intimate of settings like a dressing room in a department store or in a waiting room at a hospital or clinic. Most likely, we're being monitored. Cameras have become common and customary in our society and are effective deterrents to prevent and document crime and abuse. We have cameras installed in my dad's apartment. You may ask why. This past summer, my dad Dennis started to become more unstable on his feet, which is really common in the later stages of Alzheimer's. We received several calls from the care facility that they had documented falls in the common areas. On a Sunday morning this summer, we received a call from his care team. They didn't document a fall, but believed when it happened, as they noticed an increased weakness in his right side and, and a, more of a pronounced limp. An EMT came that morning, and they did a head-to-toe assessment. They did not believe he had any, bro any broken bones, so we decided to monitor him at his care facility. I drove over that day, and as you may know or may not know, that transporting a loved one with Alzheimer's outside of the facility can be really challenging. It's really hard on them. We made that a decision that very morning to install visible cameras in his room. We installed them because of the likelihood that my dad would have future falls. We believed that some of the falls would most likely occur in his room behind closed doors. Our primary concern was for his safety and security. Should he fall his in his private apartment, he could lay on the floor for an extended period of time without aid being rendered. We know that due to his memory issues and challenge with communication due to the stroke, that most likely he would not be able to tell the care team that he fell, if he was in pain, if he was hurt, or if he hit his head. Simply put, we wanted to make sure that we could document falls and provide that information to his care team. My brother's wife and I scanned video clips through the day and night. Shortly after installing the camera in my dad's room, I found him on the floor. Within minutes, I could call the care team and let them know they came in and made an assessment to determine if he was injured. When he laid on the floor, he didn't make a sound. He tried to get himself up. He never called out. Supporting and loving someone with Alzheimer's takes its toll. Supporting and loving two parents battling diseases is heartbreaking, but still an honor and privilege. Having cameras provides a sense of comfort, security, and control for our family. This monitoring allows us to address care needs appropriately. We have been able to provide critical information to the doctor at the VA about his compulsive and repetitive behaviors so that we can make educated decisions about his care plan and medication needs. Videotaping has shown gaps in safe care and exposed the inconsistency in the two hour safety and wellness checks that should be happening. When this occurs, we're able to talk to the management team and express ourselves appropriately and get that fixed. This legislation would level the playing field. 
Families will have the ability to choose whether or not they want to install cameras for the safety of their loved ones. They will not have to live in the possible fear of retaliation or eviction. Families entrust their loved ones with an expectation that the contract and the promises of safe and timely care will be met. Electronic monitoring provides comfort to families, especially when they live a significant distance from their loved one in a care facility, or for families like ours who are supporting two parents, battling diseases, living apart from one another. Trust but verify. I urge you to allow our families to have the choice. Provide them with the peace of mind through allowing electronic monitoring. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us today. Okay, go ahead as soon as you're ready. Okay. State your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for listening to my testimony today. My name is Kay Rommelkamp. This past Sunday marked the fifth anniversary of our mother's death. Five months after our mother's death, our family received a letter from the then director of the Office of Health Facility Complaints. Quote, unfortunately, the current and projected workforce shortage decreases the available number of staff to work with vulnerable adults. This increases the possibility that staff hired are not always suited to this line of work. That is why it is so important for vulnerable persons to have strong family advocates. Your mother was extremely lucky to have you and your family intervening in her care." End quote. If your loved one resided in Minnesota's largest senior li living provider and you were paying up to $7,000 a month, I would think we would all expect proper care. Not everyone has family to monitor and intervene for them. We tried hard for 18 months to work with the facility and its management and staff to address concerns and gaps in care. I want, you to, I want to let you know how we came to install a camera, which is not done lightly by a family. In addition to our mom's claims, we had our own observations. Unexplained bruises, unshowered at times, unchanged depends, safety sensors unplugged, finding our mom alone in her room when all the other residents were eating in the dining room. Many mornings, still in bed, no cares were given. The activity director stating our private caregivers are intentionally keeping our mom secluded in her room. It was obvious to us her care plan was not being followed and or accurate as we had not had a private caregiver for six weeks. If you can imagine the trauma we felt not believing our mom when she would state, my arms hurt, they're mean to me, or she can't remember how she got her bruises or how she fell, that she was hungry or she wasn't fed, or telling us, there's a man that sleeps at the end of my bed in a chair. To this day, we are haunted as we attributed these comments to her dementia. We were not believed, our concerns were minimized, and we were repeatedly told the care was checked off on her chart, so therefore it was done. Most important, our vulnerable mom was not being properly cared for. When learning that the facility had their own cameras in the hallways and common areas, a light bulb went off. Why not put a camera in our mom's room? Fearing retaliation, we sat on this idea for over a month. I would now like to share with you the horror we found in the first three days of camera observation. Dentures and face not cleaned for three days, no showers, no escorts to meals, which often meant no meal. We discovered the morning aid would lock the door, stay inside and watch TV or sleep and not provide the cares or a meal for our mother. That was the man sleeping at the end of my mom's bed. No medications given, skip safety checks at night, Hands not washed once in three days. The hands that toileted herself. By day three, emotional and physical abuse. Being roughed up by the aide as she dresses her, snapping her bra, and the aide stating, yes, I know I'm being rough with you, but you're so frustrating, you act like a child. Repeatedly hitting our mom's leg, yelling at her, calling her a grown-ass adult multiple times. I want you to know, as we were watching this we would flee from our homes or from work to intervene and provide the cares that had gone ungiven. Once the camera was noticed on day four, the facility began to take my mom out of the room and we were greatly relieved that she was now participating in activities and getting socialization. Little did we know that she was shoved in a corner by herself, unattended, and out of view of the camera. Thankfully, another resident's daughter alerted us to this. We were appalled when we received an email a few weeks later from the director stating, unless we communicate everything regarding our mother's care, that her care will continue to be below our standards. 
Many different arguments for and against electronic monitoring have been brought forth. I would like to address three. One, notification. Requiring a resident with dementia to witness and be part of the notification process is cruel. Here is a person with a confused mind, and now we're gonna put a thought in their head that they may not be safe? Please understand how often those with dementia ruminate and obsess about an idea or thought. It would not surprise me if we had done that, that my mother would have digressed and possibly been one of the residents you read about in the paper, that elopes from a facility undetected and found wandering, or worse yet, dead in a snowbank blocks from their facility. Second, privacy. As you listen to these concerns for privacy, please consider from whom this argument is coming. We know what our mom would have wanted if we were to ask her this question. Would you rather have us find a way to let the staff know they didn't provide your cares this morning, or would you rather go up to the beauty shop where you will urinate all over yourself as well as the floor in front of your friends? This happened to my mom because she did not have it depends on. Thirdly, retaliation. By day four, the assault on our mom, the facility was well aware we had a camera. We will never know if it was poor care, lack of staff, or outright retaliation that permitted the facility, because we had a camera, on three different occasions within three weeks, for 16, 18, and 19 hours each, disregard our mother as she lay in her own soil with no food, no water, or no depends change. And since we're talking about notification, we notified the entire organization's management chain of command via email after each one of these incidents, yet it occurred three times. Had we put in the camera sooner, we most likely could have prevented the rapid decline she endured due to her abuse, neglect, and maltreatment. We wish we just could have been daughters. We wish we would have put the camera in sooner. We're trying not to look back, but rather look forward by focusing on her care, dignity, and protecting the rights of our most vulnerable. When we made the decision to move our mother to assisted living, our family's two guiding principles were that she were kept safe and she constantly felt our love. She was loved. Thank you for this opportunity for, to speak for a strong electronic monitoring laws. Thank you. Next up we have uh, Michelle Wood and Toby Pearson. Either of those individuals. Thank you, come on up. State your name for the record before you get started and then to Senator Abler's point, if you guys could be brief into the bill so that way we have some time for the committee to discuss the bill as well. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see morning. several of you are giving me your kind attention. I will reward that kindness with brevity. I am here to, my name is Michelle Wood. I think I said that, I'm nervous. I am here today to ask you to help me rescue my mother. I'm not going to tell you her long, painful story, although she has one. Instead, I'll tell you a small piece of her story relevant to Senate File 11 and why it should be modified and passed into law immediately. A year ago at this time, you heard extensive testimony. I watched it. You heard shocking stories of chronic, routine, normalized neglect, verbal abuse, bullying, and assault. You heard that families like mine have made tens of thousands of complaints to facility management, and they say there are no problems. You heard that we've made thousands of reports to the OHCFC who say that there is no reason to act or they cannot act due to insufficient evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let us gather evidence. If facility managers will not monitor and evaluate and discipline their staff, let us monitor the staff so that we can hold them accountable. Please do not compel my mom to give her consent in the presence of facility staff. Here's why. Several years ago, my mother was working full time when she was suddenly paralyzed on the left side of her body. She had to go live in long-term care at Jones Harrison. She is now trapped in bed most of the time because she is difficult to transfer into the wheelchair and the nursing staff prefer to keep her there. We hear a series of excuses all day long. The other nursing assistant is on break. It's too close to lunch. On break, too close to shift time. Shift change time. On break, too close to dinner. 
on break too late in the day. So while she lays there helpless in bed, sometimes she suffers mistreatment. She's made the mistake of reporting this treatment. She's reported three staff givers and two have retaliated. I support, by the way, criminalizing retaliation. Most recently, a caregiver said to her, I wish she would die so I didn't have to work so hard. After my mother reported that, the staff person retaliated by making her beg to use the bedpan and making her wait 64 minutes for a diaper change. I was present for that one. I timed it. The nursing assistant turned off the call light halfway through that time. I didn't see that. While my mother whimpered for an hour that the urine was stinging her skin, this nursing assistant blew her off and did a number of other tasks and then told me after my third complaint to the nurse, I was busy. Don't compel them to give their consent in front of these staff people. In many cases, they are terrified of these staff people. If you require consent, let that happen before a neutral third party, such as an ombudsman or ombudsman volunteer. And please persuade your colleagues to act now. We can't wait for another legislative session. My mother can't wait another year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pearson's up next, and if we can have Carrie Thurlow come up and switch places with Michelle Wood, uh, then we can move along a little quicker. Go ahead and start as soon as you're ready. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Toby Pearson, Care Providers of Minnesota, today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. Just like to say that we support this bill. First, I'd like to say thank you to Sean Burke and Amanda Vickstrom from Elder Justice Center for all their work on this topic in the interim. The long-term care imperative supported the work, attended the work groups, all of them, and Sean can tell you how many hours that was, but it was a lot. We found the gatherings gave better context and more time for consideration of the complexities of this topic. Thank you to the author, she's not here, but thank you as well to Senator Abler, uh, and all the staff for working with us and listening to us as the bill has been drafted and brought forward. The usage of electronic monitoring devices in senior living settings, settings is becoming customary. And Minnesota law has been silent on the specific considerations relating to use of monitoring devices in these settings. This has led to, as you have heard, a variety of responses in the community and a lot of problems with the responses to those complaints. This legislation would make clear that a resident can choose to install a hidden camera, it sets the clear guidelines for the consent of the adult, and privacy considerations, and addresses notifications when a camera is installed. We believe that seniors should be able to live independently for as long as they are able. They should have access to safe, quality care options they need in the communities that they call home. Protection of vulnerable adults lies at the very core of our work and is best accomplished through partnership. We have been working together with other stakeholders to ensure that we have a system that balances the values of independence, privacy, choice, autonomy, safety, protection, a variety of issues that need to be balanced. As you have heard, there are Issues with the legislation that were not consensus, the primary issue being the topic of notice, which you have heard about. Specifically, should the facilities be given a copy of a consent form or notice that electronic monitoring device will be used? Our, mo our members believe that yes, we should receive notice, not as a way to gatekeep from people doing it, but as a way to help protect and ensure and prevent more actions from taking place. If we know about it, we can help protect the privacy of that individual. And also, we feel that if we give notice to folks that there will be cameras, it will act as a deterrent from people from misbehaving the way you have heard some people refer to. However, in the spirit of compromise, the bill in front of you does have a workaround for emergency purposes that our members support. 
Again, thank you to the author for the bill for working with us, as well as all the advocates and stakeholders who attended the summer and fall meetings that allowed us to come up with a better understanding and ultimately a better resolution of many of the issues and concerns which were raised along the way. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Thurlow, next, and if we could have Sean Burke switch places with Toby, that would be great. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Carrie Thurlow with Leading Age Minnesota, also here on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. Um, my colleague, Mr. Pearson, did a, an excellent job um, making comments, so I will be extremely brief in the interest of time. Um, however, I do want to echo um, the thanks to Sean Burke, Amanda Vickstrom, and the Elder Justice Center for leading this work group this fall and um, working us through what, it, what on its face sometimes seems like a simple issue, but when you get down to some of the details are complicated, um, pushing us uh, to reach compromise. And I think the work group report in front of you and the resulting legislation really reflects that. I also want to thank both Senator Housley as well as Senator Abler for continuing to push this as a priority. This work quite frankly, represents years of work, stakeholder work. Um, while there was a really intensive effort this fall, um, quite frankly, we've had stakeholder discussions for a number of years and agree that it is time to pass legislation that clearly defines the conditions under which, uh, first of all, clearly defines that electronic monitoring for a resident is a right and defines the conditions under which um, that can be carried out and also identifies protections for um, um, pursuing that right. Um, and so in that vein, I want to echo Mr. Pearson's support for this legislation. Um, we think that it is time to clarify the conditions here. Um, electronic monitoring can be helpful in prevention of maltreatment, as well as improving communication between the family members and the providers. We've heard a number of examples of family members who are far away who like to um, also monitor, and we support that. Um, this is an important piece in our overall work this session. Um, we know that there is a broad umbrella of work before us around protection of vulnerable adults. And this electronic monitoring piece has come a long way and represents the first piece. As Senator Abler said in his introductory comments, we know there are more pieces of policy work to do in this area. And we look forward to continued stakeholder collaboration and work throughout this session to um, make some meaningful progress on this as well as other issues. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And then our last testifier is Sheila Van Pelt. If she could come up after uh, Sean Burke is done. Go ahead, Sean, start as soon as you're ready. Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, thank you for hearing this bill this morning. My name is Sean Burke. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. <clears throat> our nonprofit organization's mission is to prevent and alleviate abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation of seniors, older Minnesotans, and vulnerable adults in all its forms, wherever it may take place. We know that happens in the community, in people's own homes, and as a focus uh, of our time last year and this year in long-term care facilities. Uh, we were invited by Commissioner Malcolm, as you've heard, to host uh, another work group on this particular issue, uh, and we are happy with the variety of results that have come uh, from that. There is still a little bit of uh, work to be done, but we appreciate um, everyone's involvement. It's important to note that this electronic monitoring bill is only one piece of the package of reforms that need to occur in order for consumers to feel safe and have their rights protected and validated in long-term care facilities, but it is an important one, and it's tricky. The law is actually currently not clear. Sure, a family member or resident can put a camera in their room currently, but what happens when that camera is taken out by the facility? What happens if a facility decides to put in their contracts that no monitoring is allowed? The resulting dispute and litigation should be cleared up, and we believe that uh, this law uh, will do that. It's also tricky because we are balancing a variety of really important values. Safety for our loved ones, privacy, but also autonomy of the individual. So take, for example, the issue of resident and roommate consent. 
Subdivision three in the bill before you is a result of hours of conversation about what should happen when a resident representative chooses to place a camera on behalf of their loved one. We believe it is important that even people who have questions about their capacity <clears throat> have a general sense uh, and are notified uh, by their loved one about what is happening. Because even if you have cognitive limitations, it doesn't necessarily mean you're incapacitated. We believe subdivision three does a good job of balancing <clears throat> the autonomy of the individual in those circumstances. And finally, <clears throat> on the issue of notice, which has been mentioned as perhaps the most controversial piece of this bill, the work group considered uh, three positions. No notice to the facility at all, notice in all circumstances, and then a type of compromise, <clears throat> a limited notice for a limited amount of time. The work group considered 30 days as the appropriate amount of time. The bill in front of you has 14. The Minnesota Elder Justice Center continues to believe 30 is the proper amount of time. It provides uh, for families to be able to watch a shifting uh, of staffing patterns that as we know can occur and can be different depending on weekend shifts uh, as the month progresses. It also gives the individual time because importantly in this bill, the notice is actually sent to the ombudsman's office. And so it gives the individual and or their family the chance to work with the ombudsman to better understand uh, their rights and their options moving forward. And the 30 days is, is the reasonable amount of time. Still, uh, we greatly appreciate uh, the support from uh, many of you, uh, the authors, and uh, I should point out um, that also uh, partisan and nonpartisan staff specifically sat in on just about every single hour of our work. So we thank them very much. Thank you for hearing the bill. Appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Van Pelt, uh, you're the, our last testifier. Just state your name for the record and go ahead and get started. Please be brief. Hi, my name is Sheila Van Pelt and I want to say thank you for allowing me to testify on very short notice. Uh, Senator Housley, I know you're listening in. Thank you for being a part in, in orchestrating and, and um, bringing this bill forward this session and g giving it with heart. Also, I just want to thank the members who have worked during the interim in putting uh, language together, balancing out needs, uh, wants and needs, and, and coming to what we have today. However, I'm going to say uh, from being here at the Capitol since 2012 discussing Minnesota Department of Health investigations, both concerns with Office of Health Facility complaints and our HMO investigations, as well as being a volunteer in a nursing home for the past eight years every Friday. I come to this with insights and experience. Um, I looked to the concerns stated by Elder Voices or uh, just now Sean Burke, listen to them. Right now, we have, an, as I look at it, since 2012 when there was this top 10% that the MDH is going to investigate of cases presented, we have over 400 a week going on. We're still not really sure what is the amount that we call adequate? Because we know there's frivolous ones down here and people say, well, lost their dentures, this, that, and the other. But there are so many that fall within this major gap. And when I've been at the nursing home where I've been at, there are people there who say, well, what about us? What about my concerns? So that someone didn't die. Where are my concerns being heard? So we've got this gap. And with that gap, People need to feel like they are getting protection that they need because they are not going to get it from the state. Right now, I look at our general bond here, and on page B21, there is a health care provider tax. Each resident pays $2,815 per month. That's $235, a, or excuse me, $2,815 per year. That's $235 per month. They don't even know they're paying it. And I believe there is a federal waiver that I want to get the information on it. They're paying that money. It's not noted in room and board or anything. It's a hidden bed tax. What are they getting? And now when we have our inspections done by the state, let's just say they're unannounced visits. We already know that people do window dressing. If you go into a, a department store and if they know the district manager's coming in, they spruce up. 
And I have been present at all of, you know, for the every week that I've been at a nursing home, I know, oh, we had to, you know, make sure we had everything dressed up good when the, ins when the state comes in. We are not being authentic. We are not catching people as they are. So when we have a, a mon uh, an electric, electronic monitoring in the room that's unannounced, it's as close to auth authentic. When it becomes known, people behave differently. And I will tell you this, if, you, if someone in their heart of hearts who is not an ethical, honest, loving caregiver, and then believe me, it is hard for management to find those who in their heart are there to serve. So we have those who fill and take a job, and if they want to retaliate or it's within their soul to not be kind to another human being, that abuse is going to maybe go somewhere else. So when the, when the aides know, the nursing home knows, Let's just say it doesn't happen in the room now because everybody doesn't want to be caught. What about the bathing areas? And so where this bill you know, can address these areas, I don't even think we're just going far enough to talk about what goes on in the bathing areas where we can at least have audio. Not maybe by the family, but by the facility because that's where it's going to happen and that's where I've been told by residents that they get roughed up a bit. So we are here to protect the nursing home resident. And there are a lot of concerns that go on on what we shouldn't be doing or how to protect the nursing home, but these people are paying a hell of a lot of money and also with a tax they don't even know they're paying. So when you discern this, think about that gap that is not going to be served by this state and look to that gap and say, how do we help these families fill that gap so they feel good and we all work together to protect the most uh, vulnerable in our society. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll open it up for committee discussion. I've got Senator Eakin first Mr. and then Chair, Senator if I, just, if I could just offer a comment and then sure. I'll- Sure, Senator just Abler. To, just to, and I appreciate all the testifiers who came. Uh, I just want to point out a couple things that uh, the consent is private. It's on a form and it, it's not in front of necessarily anybody. Uh, there, um, the, there are penalties actually in here. If they, uh, if you read the bill on page uh, seven and eight, uh, if you, if if there's non-compliance, there actually would be a penalty for retaliation, which would, um, which is uh, the word retaliation is. I'm not sure it's mentioned in statute anywhere else, but here now is something, uh, a couple of times that's in statute, and you could be, have a correction order and a fine if you're retaliating or violating many of the other things. And finally, the ombudsman has strengthened considerably uh, in this interaction, and that's a really positive step. So that's just wanted to comment those. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you for those clarifications, Senator Abler. Senator Eakin, I have you up first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, and I, I know you're not chief authoring the bill, uh, but I uh, hope you can maybe answer a couple of questions that I had. Uh, one dealing with the ombudsman, uh, I know that uh, in the case of an exemption, uh, there's uh, requirements uh, that they have to meet in order to get that exemption from the notification requirement to the, to the, the facility and uh, uh, to get that 14 days uh, to be able to put a camera in the room. Um, is the ombudsman their role here? Is it just to file the paperwork or do they actually play a role in determining whether an exemption should be granted? to the notification requirement? Well, um, I can or, answer, okay. Yeah. I can answer part of that, and then there's uh, between uh, staff and uh, some of the long-term care folks or whoever. Um, so it's, the notification, they, you don't have to tell, uh, it's, there's no awarding of the exemption, you just get it, and then you just make sure you've told the ombudsman and, and informed uh, the roommate, actually. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Abler. So that, that answers my question on that. And, I, and then I was just wondering, as far as the process, if you know, is, is the plan to move this as a standalone bill, or is it going to be folded into a larger bill dealing with other elder abuse issues, or, or the larger omnibus HHS uh, bill? Mr. Chair, Senator Eakin, a standalone. Okay. Anything that's going to judiciary next, or uh, health and human health health. services, health. finance and policy next? It has a few stops along the way. So. Okay. Thanks, Senator. Yeah, Everybody. thank you. And I appreciate all your work on this as well. So, thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'm glad you, you talked about the process because I was wondering how this bill was going to be moving because there are some 
and, and I'm, I'm not an attorney, although I played one in a play one time, Senator Abler, so um, thank you, Senator Ralph, for smiling at that. There is, there's a, a lot of permissive language throughout this bill, a, a lot of maze that, that seem to not settle well with me when, when it comes down to trying to put the claw on, on if somebody did something wrong and there needs to be some accountability. There's this may permissive stuff and, and I'm, not, I'm not liking that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not understanding if the discussion needs to go to criminalization of it. I mean, that's why you have attorneys that can handle that kind of conversation. But I do think it's kind of soft language when you have permissive you know, you could, you should, well, maybe, and, and I know the world that we work in that isn't there. And then I think, and I think if you go to the next level, maybe that's the discussion that needs to occur, um, because there needs to be some clear, some clear examples of this, lit if it becomes non-permissible litigation process that could occur, because if you knowingly did something against somebody on the behalf of whatever, but you knowingly did that, then I don't think a may um, five hundred dollar possible fine is 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 enough. The other thing is there 's the word reasonable that 's utilized a, a bunch of times in in this um, in this statute or this proposed bill and and have we defined what reasonable attempt is or reasonable amount or reasonable i you know under reasonable accommodation you can say well yeah section 504 of the rehab act states that 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 right but i'm not seeing any clarification on what is reasonable and so um i know that's probably again a, a legal definition or if you could get Sean Burke up here to kind of talk about that or somebody to talk about um why they did not have a definition of reasonable so with that, I just wanted to have that conversation. Uh, Mr. Senator Hoffman, I think uh, Mr. Burke would be a good choice, or one of the other uh, representatives of the uh, industry could comment on that. And I, but I, and I want to remind people: I don't think this is a perfect bill. But if you've gone, if you remember the testimony, uh, anybody, anywhere, anytime, doing anything, or the agency, the the company could say, "Oh, it's in our contract; you can't do that," and then you're stuck. And so this is this this gives a lot of rights. And but anyway, I'll let Mr. Burke comment if you if you can, Mr. Chair. Mr. Burke. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Hoffman, <clears throat> thank you for those questions. Uh, I very much share uh, your concern and passion for uh, people with disabilities, uh, and <clears throat> that those concepts I think were taken into account um, it, during the process of the work group uh, specifically. Um, if you look, uh, there there is a <clears throat> we we did work on. We talked extensively about uh, are we going to define reasonable accommodation? Do we want to go the route that we see in uh, uh, human rights laws and other kind of uh, disability protections? Um, we chose a, a balance. So if you look on uh, starting on line 3.19, um, there was a fear uh, that sometimes the addition of a roommate um, and um, maybe their inability, they didn't want to consent uh, to monitoring, would then mean that, well, I can no longer monitor. So we do spell out pretty extensively uh, a facility's um, obligation then to uh, work through that issue and try to make some accommodations, not reasonable accommodation in terms of Human Rights Act um, or defined when we're talking about disability protections, but a kind of more general sense. And um, I think we came to um, a, a reasonable conclusion on that. So that, that was one uh, uh, particularly difficult area that we worked through with some um, definition and explanation. And Mr. Chair and Senator, Senator Hoffman, Hoffman. Um, and maybe if we should, we, you could discuss maybe a bit further, and, and Mr. Burke, uh, the penalties with the commissioner may issue uh, <laughs> various correction orders. And I think you get back into the OHFC thing and they're going to look into it. And, but I, I don't I mean that that's certainly worthy of discussion. May Mr. Burke comment on that too, just to help people know why it's permissive that the commissioner could issue an order or a fine. Mr. Burke? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Senator <laughs> Hoffman, uh, before I do that, uh, one other area that we discussed reasonable accommodation because this issue did come up on 6.17. Um, there are issues about, okay, <clears throat> who's responsible for the, the costs and, and installation uh, of this, but um, we wanted to make sure that uh, if a facility has 
um, some technological capabilities uh, that they would make those available. Uh, and so again, there's kind of a, a listing of um, accommodations that, that they, a, a non-exhaustive list of accommodations that they should make to make sure that someone can actually um, put something up. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. And then Senator uh, Hoffman. As a follow-up, I, I think the, the thing about what defines a reasonable attempt, is it, is it I've said, oh, I'm going to do this, or is the reasonable attempt something that is, you know, a, a checklist? I don't want to get into the micromanagement of it, but I just have a hard time with understanding what reasonable attempt is, because to me, um, and I'll give you a little background. In my 20s, I ran a juvenile detention facility, right? And we reasonably checked on youth. Well, the reasonable was never defined, and the youth ended up committing suicide. And so that's why it comes back to define reasonable. What is reasonable? A reasonable attempt. How do we get to that kind of uh, question on that? So, and I'm not, I'm not, just it's just not settling well with me on that because it's too ambiguous. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. Burke? Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, uh, one of the first things we learned in law school was when it comes to reasonableness, everyone can argue all sides. <laughs> and so I, I, I share uh, some of your discomfort with that. Um, as a citizen, as an attorney, I kind of love the word reasonable <laughs> because you can argue a variety of things. I think what we did here was a fair balance. Again, if you look at, at 6.18 and 6.19, it specifically says, and it addresses some concerns, part of a reasonable attempt means you need to make your public Wi-Fi available. Uh, one of the things... Um, uh, one of the things that we heard from some consumers is they didn't, they didn't feel that they were always being allowed to access that type of um, accommodation. So uh, we, we try to, to address that without having a 100-page bill spelling out every single instance. Uh, and, then, and then finally, to the permissive language uh, for, for the commissioner, um, there's a variety of <clears throat> obligations in here that are actually are musts and facilities must do. Um, they must allow monitoring. Uh, if, if the parameters are followed. Um, but there are also kind of other more minor um, musts. And so the discretion um, that the uh, commissioner has, uh, we anticipate the commissioner being able to um, ap appro appropriately sanction uh, facilities based on the level of um, violation that they see in this particular instance. And it doesn't um, infringe on the commissioner's power um, that is elsewhere in statute to take more drastic action uh, against uh, housing with services providers and home care providers. You good, Senator Hoffman, or did you have another one? No, I'm good. I Perfect. We have Senator Ralph next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I, I want to just make a little shout out here to the, to the stakeholders and the working group and the, the fine work that they've done on this. I've been involved in this particular endeavor pretty much since the, the start of this uh, inquiry. And, and I really wanted to say that, they, that the working group did a fine job in trying to craft something, a bill that will, will provide the protections that we're looking for. And so I, I just wanted to say that, that, that Mr. Burke and Mr. Th uh, Ms. Thurlow, and I, I probably will miss a bunch of people, but the ones that are here today, please extend my gratitude for your work to, to the people that you work with. I, I've got some specific things. Uh, First of all, Mr. Burke, I, 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 I know in law school we talk about a reasonable person, but we don't talk about an unreasonable person. So someday I'd like to get a, defini a definition of that as well. Um, I'd like to go first to uh, per, uh, line 4.31 in discussing the issue of what we have to do or what a, a person has to do uh, in order to not notify the facility, and there's the, uh, starting at uh, paragraph, or actually three, four point three two. Uh, there's a phrase that says one of the conditions, and this is an and, so all of these conditions have to be met, including the ombudsman and the uh, the the, the, the note, uh, submits the notification to the facility within the fourteen days, et cetera. But it says between the time the electronic monitor is placed under this paragraph and the time the resident or resident representative submits the completed notification consent, consent form to the facility, the resident or resident representative immediately submits a Minnesota Adult Reporting Center report or police report 
upon evidence from the electronic monitoring device that suspected maltreatment has occurred. I, I don't understand that. Basically, we're, we're saying we can put the camera in without notice, but within 14 days, there has to be an incident of abuse that's reported. And I, I, I guess I'm misreading that, or I'm not reading it correctly, but that seems to be, uh, to me, a bit convoluted. Now, maybe there's been something uh, in the in the DE amendment, but I'm 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 looking at the DE amendment, and that seems to be a, a requirement. Uh, I, I guess I don't follow because there is a, the, the conjunctive is and not or, uh, so it means that all of those conditions must be met. And I don't understand how you can. It's almost being prescient to know that there's been abuse uh, 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 or will be abuse within that 14-day period. So I, I'd like some explanation. If Senator I Abler. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Ralph. I actually read that three times to get it straight myself. Um, <laughs> I know what the times. intent is that if the monitoring device uh, shows some kind of maltreatment, that that report is filed immediately. Uh, that's the intent of it. And it may well be that there's some wordsmithing to make that a bit more clear. But, and so if no maltreatment occurs, there's no reporting to be made. But in the event the camera does show that somebody uh, hits, hit, hit the resident or deprive them of some you know, reasonable, sorry, um, thing that they were supposed to be doing for them, then you would, there'd be a, a complaint filed immediately about that. That's what that is. Well, I, I see it says upon evidence, report upon evidence from the electronic monitoring. Um, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I just, it seems Abler. convoluted, and maybe we can look at this, uh, but I, if, if that's the intent, and I, I kind of, kind of thought that where it says report upon evidence. So that, that seems to say it, but uh, it, it, it is, I think it's a little bit difficult to understand. Um, and maybe, maybe there's some additional, I mean, I, as I said, I read it several times and it, it, it was very Senator difficult. Abler might have another Mr. comment Chair, on Senator Ralph, this is going to the Judiciary Committee. Like, uh, <laughs> well, I think any I'm, I'm word, trying, any I'll be very honest. Evidence in it is going to draw some attention. Yeah. So I, I'm I, trying I to really avoid a, a, a fight in Judiciary. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that funny? I don't know. Uh, the, the other thing that I, that I, that I'm, I'm very concerned about is the, uh, uh, the use of the, of the data. Who owns it? Who's who's responsible for it? If it gets uh, there's some some language about improper dissemination. Uh, I, I'm concerned about that. Now, one of the things that I know we were, were talking about was the requirement that the if there's going to this is going to be used uh, as evidence, or the evidence is used from the tape to 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 bring about discipline. Uh, there is there, there's there's some vague language about using it for the. Uh, let me see if I can find the exact. Uh, I'm sorry, I had this marked, and now it's in it's in my it was in the earlier version. Let me just look. That that the that that this that, that the the data be available, and I have a lot of concerns about it. First of all, once the data becomes made available to any sort of uh, public governmental uh, entity, then we run into some data practices issues, uh, and we're going to have to look at those. Uh, but the, it's, it's the fact is it doesn't, to me, it doesn't look like there's any requirement that the data be made available either in a, in a court proceeding or in an administrative proceeding uh, that that employee is being, or even the facility is being, is being uh, Investigated or being charged with some kind of a uh, some kind of uh, improper act, and I, I just I wonder if you could speak to the to that. I mean, there was a section in the bill that we passed last year that was very specific on that. Now I, I understand there may be some stakeholder issues here, but I'm wondering if if, if we're going to address this or what the what the the, con the concept is here. Thank you, Mr. Senator Abler. Senator Ralph, that's on page seven, lines twelve through fourteen. <laughs> And I have a feeling this will be discussed a bit more in another committee that uh, talks about evidence. Um, but it, it simply says this could be used as evidence uh, should a further proceeding occur that's criminal or otherwise. And so it, it just identifies this as another source of evidence. Um, and that's all I have to tell you about that. And I believe this will be fleshed out in the Judiciary oh. Committee. Uh, in uh, terms of how protected it is and mm -hmm. what kind of data they're going to declare yeah, it to be. Mr. Chair, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been in a courtroom uh, and practiced, uh, but it seems to me that this 
except as required under other law, recording or copy made as provided in this section may only be used as for the purpose of addressing health, safety, or welfare concerns of the resident or citizens, uh, uh, residents. I don't see anything in here that says that that must be made available to the person who is being charged. Senator Abler. Um, Senator Ralph, I suggest you hold that question for judiciary. The, the, the point of this is, it, it seems, it depends who is running the camera, I suppose, but it, if this is like the camera that we heard about from people wanting to keep track of their mom, that they wanted to file a charge against this individual who, you know, that has done harm to their, their loved one, that this would be evidence that would be admissible. I think that's the point, and I think, and th this is a, a a really good draft of a consensus of a work group trying to mm -hmm. cobble it together. And I think that fleshing it out further in judiciary mm -hmm. will be very important. And I have a feeling that there'll be some amendments offered there to, to make it yeah, eminently right. clear that, that, this is, that this is bona fide evidence. I think that's the point here. Mm -hmm. And then judiciary folks can mm -hmm. sort it through some more. Thank well, you. I think Thank we you, want sir. that. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I think we that? want that. Right. So I want to make sure that that's what, where we get. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to, as I said before, I, I understand the function of the Judiciary Committee and I want to try and uh, sort of prepare us for that so that we, we, we have our ducks in a row when we go there. And Mr. Chair and, and Senator Ralph, I would imagine that if this were evidence, then it would be available to the, uh, to the accused uh, through discovery and all that. So that's all I, I'm done being a lawyer. I'm, that's, that's the best I got. So. All right. Next up, we have Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, I appreciate everybody's testimony uh, on this issue, and I'm glad this has a, a few more stops, uh, especially welcome. We have to send uh, Senator Housley to judiciary. It's going to be a, a, a good um, process. But the, the concern Senator Ralph brought up as well as to the data and the infrastructure um, for the, from the facilities perspective and the accessibility. I mean, we've got very limited um, broadband capabilities in, in so many areas around the state. Um, and we're, we're working on it, but I'm, I'm concerned about the same issues around what technical analysis and support was available to the work group. And, and I, I don't expect an answer, but I think those are some of the things that we need to make sure that we clarify as we move forward. I, I like the monitoring, I think we should do it, but I think our, heart, uh, our heartbreaking stories that we heard today were um, the immediate, you know, the, the, to be able to watch that and it has to be horrendous. Um, but to me, what it points out is the abject failure of our governing bodies. In, in which those that oversee this process. And so I think we need to, as we move forward, to, to clarify how this one tool can provide that. But what we, what we have to also talk about is make sure that we're in crisis mode. We can't go along with, with three or 400 or 500 reports a week and, and a government entity feels great and they're really committed. But every one of these providers, and we know they have great intent, every one of these families is, has, has a loved one in that, in that facility. And when you, you talk about the, the, the ongoing direct criminal abuse um, of elders, we should have an immediate um, ability for an agency to respond. I want them in the facilities. I want them providing oversight. It can't take 18 months to train an investigator, and I don't think we need investigators. We need somebody who understands basic human decency and care and to get them out there. I think Sheila uh, Van Pelt, Ms. Van Pelt, did a great job in highlighting that. We've got these reports, and, and just to make a report and then to really look to, from the reports and the agencies have failed miserably to provide us with any comprehensive detail about what those reports are. And we've got maybe a couple hundred of actual abuse complaints. Um, it, this is crisis, and, and we're gonna have to make sure that we get those agencies and do something differently. Um, to make sure that these things are resolved. And then as far as notice, the only other comment, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for providing the time, is, is around the notification. I would much rather see um, the ombudsman take a much more significant role to make sure that privacy and notification and that information or the advocacy is available to every family member who's seeking. We have very capable people who gave test testimony. I think they became experts when they never planned on it. Um, but not everybody's in that at that same capability, and so we're going to need to make those ombudsman resources available, and I would much rather see them as we work through this process to have a, a very um, affirmative role in making sure that if we're under investigation, this is real time, we're talking about criminal neglect, we, we don't need two weeks of horrible acts to act upon that, that complaint. 
and so that's where I want, I want everybody involved in the notification, but, and you know you have my commitment to do everything we can to, to get DHS and Department of, of Health um, functioning so we don't, have to, we don't have great reports and continued abuse, that we actually take action and we resolve issues. So I thank you, and that's all I have. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Kren. Well, last one on our list, Senator Friends. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Abel. And please thank Senator Housley. Advocates, uh, my take would be that you have made progress here. I just want to note that we had the impression that the notice um, sort of agreement that's in the bill maybe was a little bit more uh, peace in the valley, and so you have work to do there. The electronic monitoring breaks into two basic dichotomies. One, family should have the right to watch their loved one. And two, to the extent it deters conduct that we'd like to deter, abuse and neglect, um, how do we work through to make it fair to the facility, fair to the family, and find a due process argument? I think we're well on our way, and I want to thank you and everybody who testified. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, any other brief member comments or questions? S Senator Rood? Well, I have to, I mean, I'm outnumbered here. I have to make some comment. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for the tremendous work that they have done on this bill. We have been working on this for a very long time, and it's come a very long way. And I know it still has a journey to go, but I have to tell you one of the things that really uh, is important to me, along with the safety of our elder people, is the dignity and the privacy. And I think that that sometimes is forgotten, and the, the ultimate person in this bill is our senior citizen. And so whether you are a provider or you are a family member, it is the resident and the senior citizen that we are truly talking about. And so I, want, I just uh, caution people to remember that our senior citizens have dignity and privacy that should be of uh, utmost importance also. So and thank you, and I think this is a great, great work, and we have some work to do, but where we were and where we've come to is amazing. So thank you all. Thank you for your comments, Senator Rood. Senator Abler, did you want to respond to that quick? Well, and just a final comment, and then we can probably move to a vote, I think. Um, I want to remind people that in 2016, uh, Senator Johnson had a, a work group was controversial. And so if you recall, it was a big deal, and can we even do that? This has come from worlds apart to here, and a, a number of members have recognized that. Um, and so just to summarize, um, what we're going to see, I think, through other bills moving in this one is a greater reliance on the ombudsman to have more direct contact, which I think is going to be really productive. Other bills are going to show increasing staffing there and, and the, the interactions that I think are strengthened. But I think even the deterrence that Senator Friends mentioned, where um, a facility knows there's cameras around, they're going to have to, up, they're going to, have to improve the the uh, adequacy of their staff and their behaviors, even when they're challenged, very, very challenged in finding people who are qualified to serve. Not a silver bullet, but a really good start. Uh, Senator Housley has really been on, put her heart into this, and, but the advocates have too, when you hear the compelling stories. And I see in this a move from worlds apart to working toward a resolution. I think this draft goes a long way, it's a little ways to go, but. And with that, I urge uh, members' support to move it to the next committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. And I know we did go a little bit over time today, but I realize that this discussion is extremely important. And Senator Housley, as you stated, Senator Abler, worked very hard on this bill as well as you. And I, I appreciate everything you guys have done. And I know that you'll both continue to keep working on it. And I appreciate that. And I would encourage the advocates to continue to work with both you and Senator Housley to make sure that when this finally does go to the floor, we get a good package. So thank you for that. With that, Senator Abler moves that Senate File 11, as amended, uh, be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Health and Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion does prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Abler. With that, uh, the next Aging Committee will meet on Wednesday, February 13th at 8.30 a.m. Thank you, and thank you for staying with us a little late today. We are adjourned.